Welcome everyone to the first ever BeagleCast, the bi-weekly live podcast about all things BeagleBoard. I'm Andre, I work at Text Instruments, and my focus being on community and dev platforms. Anyone else want to introduce themselves? Jason? Hey, sure. I'm, I'm Jason Kreidner. I'm a founder of BeagleBoard. I'm a board member. Um, and, you know, I support all things BeagleBoard. Yeah, hello oh, everyone. Uh, uh, this is Deepak Katri. And, yeah, I work as a product uh, development engineer at BeagleBoard.org, and I am the founder of Upshadda Labs. Hey, folks. I'm Nishant. Um, I work at Texas Instruments, also part of BeagleBoard for quite a few years, if I recollect. Uh, since the original Beagle board, the 3630 version of the board. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's fun to hack on the board. That I'm Robert Nelson. I work at DigiKey. I'm on the foundation of the board. I'm actually at office today, so I can't have my video running. So I'm the blank person hiding behind the scenes. But I help Jason and the foundation uh, basically build the images, build the kernel, build the U-boot, complaining to all the maintainers, helping the maintainers, you name it, everything. Yeah, and for those people that don't know, BeagleBoard.org exists only as a, a nonprofit foundation. There is no kind of a for-profit arm. Um, but of course, you know, we, we try to make sure that everybody in the, the, the chain, right, from the semiconductor manufacturers to the board assembly to the distribution, right, they're all not, not getting rich, but they're making, you know, a reasonable amount of money to make sure it's sustainable and we can actually keep this um, available for as long a time as possible um, to members of the, the community, right? So, um, you know, none of us are, are making more money the more um, boards sell. Um, but we all care about, you know, making stuff that the pro the, the, um, that enables developers to do more cool stuff, right? It's the projects, um, and the longevity that really, I think make everybody that I'm looking at happy, right? That they know that they're contributing to something where getting more developers, more Linux developers, more people with more knowledge, how to go and make, um, more cool things and then going all the way to actually making real products that are going up in space or going under the oceans or, um, you know, helping to, to improve the, the, the um, ecology everywhere that they go. Um, you know, these are the people that are, these are some of the people, some of the key people that are helping making that happen. So, um, Andre, thanks for putting this together. Thank you. And anytime we'll have a rotating cast of people coming and, you know, I don't, I think I speak for everyone here when I say we also just enjoy playing with boards. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's part of the fun. So I guess to, to jump into our topics here. So Beagle Play has its first killer app. Uh, you and uh, Robert last week had a DigiKey webinar where you talked about uh, how you're integrating with Home Assistant. Do you want to talk a bit about that? I'll jump in since I can't see Robert's face. Um, the, um, yeah, Home Assistant, I think, is a really cool project, right? Because, you know, it's 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 about taking control in, in your home, right? Um, you know, not just having um, other people controlling all these things um, in your home. Um, and it's all open source. And it runs really fantastic on Beagle Play, right? So Beagle Play has that radio built in. Um, it's got the ability to do the Zigbee and of course with the Beagle Connect Freedom, um, we've got a really easy way for it to go and add other sensors and actuators in there. So I thought that was a fun webinar to do and um, of course always fun working with the folks over at DigiKey. Um, I still see Robert on mute. Did you have any comments on the, the webinar? Oh yes. Yeah. What I love about it most is your home assistant versus and other things, you can build your own sensors and devices. So by just having a Beagle Play up and running, grab another microcontroller and start sending sensor data to it and show it live. It, it's a little echo still coming in. But yeah, it just makes it so nice and handy with the Beagle Play and yeah, bring up your own sensors. So you can look at things in your house. You're not tied to someone's ecosystem of the, of the big guys. Yeah, and I think it really does qualify as kind of one of those killer apps because if you don't do anything else with your board but this, and there's like a billion other things you can do with it, um, but if it it's, it's pretty worthwhile just to have this um, up and running in your house. Yeah, at this point, I've had one that I've been running for a week and a half that I just bought for myself. That it's you know that's that's my home assistant box now. I don't I I have a Raspberry Pi behind me that's gathering dust because of that. So I was watching the the, the home assistant guys. Did they have their a release party recently? And, and, and they were talking about how, you know, well, you all my friends want to get it. And I just have to tell them, hey, why don't you just wait a couple of weeks because you can't actually get the platforms that run it. Um, well, now you can. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you can actually get your hands on Beagle Play. So that's a 
a, a nice thing too, right? So, you know, we're always trying to make sure that, that the boards are available and um, not unobtainium. And so that's definitely something with, with Beagle Play. Not only does it run it the best, um, it also is something you can get right now. Yeah, and you're not going to discontinue it overnight or, you know, say anything like that, that they're going to be available. There's a commitment there. Yeah. Um, and I think 10 one, years. Of the, one of the Thank best you, things, 10 years, yeah, exactly. I think one of the best things about um, Beagle Play in general is that with a with a Raspberry Pi, right, you have, you need the Pi, you need your radio that's external if you want to do Zigbee, you need to do an SD card for boot media. And then with Home Assistant in particular, you actually don't want to use an SD card because uh, it, it right cycles quite a bit to the SD card. So there's a chance that, you know, in a year, your SD card's dead. Um, well, with the Play, you have the MMC on board, so no issues there. It's just, you know, you plug it in, you're good to go. You have, it's your entire box. And yeah, the power consumption is better, right? Because you're doing like three watts tops. Yeah, I don't know why people would want to use SD cards to actually run their OS. That just um, spells disaster. Um, you know, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and forever. Still not excuse to not have a backup. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's what you use the SD card to make backups and the network to make backups, but you shouldn't be running off of it every day. Um, then, yeah, so backups. I mean, I don't know. I, I, so I know for me, like a lot with the with the Beagle, the passion is I was explaining to, um, I, was, I was talking to Bash about what a computer is. Bash is my son, so I have a seven-year-old son who's also playing. Um, he, um, I was trying to talk to him about, you know, why daddy does this Beagle thing, you know, what's it all about? And, um, and I, I was asking him about what's a, um, a computer, right? And, you know, he tells me that, like, like a phone's not a computer. It has a touch screen. Um, and, you know, they're just, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I, for me, the, the idea of, of people learning about what a computer is and where things are and how things actually work and understanding things like, oh, I need to back up my data um, is part of the passion for me for, for doing Beagle. Right. You know, it's got the killer things you can just go and do and just run. Um, but it's also a way just to learn a lot more about, you know, computers. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's a good intermediate step. Nishant, you're always talking about how you want to get in the hands of high schoolers or middle schoolers. Any exactly. any comments exactly. there? Yeah. So so the Beagle board, the beauty about it is everything is accessible. If you let your curiosity go, you can learn really deep stuff, uh, all the way from how Linux kernel works, or if you want to stay in the user space, how applications work. Uh, and a system like Beagle Play is seriously complex. If you look at it from an embedded system perspective, there are so many microcontrollers and radios all interacting together. So what what uh, what was done with the Home Assistant is probably one of the many applications that you could probably do. Um, with the interfaces like Quick, Grow, uh, Microbus, the opportunities are just tremendous. You can connect um, daisy chain up multiple uh, little boards that have uh, specific sensors hooked up. Uh, you could do robotics for that matter. So yeah, sky's the it, limit. It, it's, it's tricky because I think every single person on here is an electrical engineer. Uh, so, right. But, you know, I think when we look at who Beagle Play users um, are or should be, right. Yeah, they might be engineers, but they might be chemical, civil engineers, or they might be a high school kid um, or, um, you know, uh, college students. Right. Right. Um, we're just starting up with um, Google Summer of Code again. So I think we've just gotten um, our Google Summer of Code, code internships um, assigned. So students have found out what they're doing, right? And so, you know, some of these students are really brand new to, to Linux. Um, of course, we're also doing um, a Zephyr-based uh, project this year. Um, and, um, you know, I think that even though you know, we all have our degrees in electrical engineering. I think that we're very much interested in, in engaging those people that don't, right? We love it so much. We wish everybody would love, you know, love it and learn to, to, to do these, do these things, um, whether or not they want to actually go get a, a double E degree. And I think that's part of the beauty of it, right? Is with something like Beagle, you can, well, Beagle Play at least, you know, you have the easy to use experience that kind of abstracts some of it for you. Uh, where you don't need to worry about connections, you don't need to worry about a lot of the software backend. But if you want to, you know, drill down and look at the kernel source code, you know, you can 
you can go into all these sub modules and then kind of look at how it's done. Um, and yeah, you, know, you can deep fair. dive and go go bare metal and um, you know certainly look at the U boot sources. But um, we have some really interesting projects going going forward, right? That are going to the to continue to dive deeper and to explain more um, at the lowest possible levels. And even though Beagle Play is a, like the the AM six two SOC is a very complex um, subsystem. That's one that's really really well documented. Um, and you know, for modern high performance computer functions, right? It's still reasonably simple, right? Um, compared to what else you can 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 get into, right? Yeah, it's got these R fives and the M fours and the PRUs and all these other things that you can you can you can do and you can dive into and understand, but you really can understand them. Um, and the the subsystem is reasonably you know, the, all the, the different subsystems are really nicely organized with full documentation um, and nobody's hiding like fundamental things from you. Um, and I know at some point you're going to talk about the, the GPU stuff, which we're all really excited about because that's one of the things that we're really looking about, you know, peeling back some of the, um, the veil from right now with upstream um, well, not upstream, but but open source. There's now an open source user space for the imagination um, GPU, right? And we're kind of taking some some baby steps to really get that running as the main way to do um, you know graphics acceleration as well. Yeah. So Nishan, Robert, do you want to comment on the on the work you've done so far, the imagination driver, and then the progress you've made? The goal here for those who are not familiar with it is to get full desktop acceleration on X11 and Wayland. On Beagle Play to actually get full full GPU enablement for times when you might want to use something that involves HMI or any kind of graphics because the hardware is there, um, the software is very close to being in a in a good shape. Yeah, um, graphics on embedded system has a bit of a history. Um, there are different different graphics stacks that are present. Uh, when you start up, let's say Chrome on your desktop PC, for example, you you take a lot of things for granted. Uh, that has not been the case in the embedded industry from time immemorial. Uh, things have started to change, and they started changing around four or five years with Vulkan coming in and abstraction under Vulkan. Uh, Vulkan is one of the frameworks. Uh, for people who use desktop systems, you, you folks are probably familiar with maybe a Genome or XFCE kind of environment, uh, which is your Linux desktop environment. Uh, what works in the back end is the interesting part. Uh, what Imagination is working on right now is to enable Vulkan interface with what we call as a MISA layer sitting on top uh, with upstream kernel drivers and Linux firmware repositories all put together. Robert is one of those few people who have actually picked up their RFC patches and started integrating in. Uh, Robert, you can probably go in a little more detail as to your experience. So kind of our plan with uh, the Beagleboard Foundation is uh, for Mesa, we are really targeting Debian Bookworm, which is going to be released uh, this June, middle June. Uh, it's Right now, we're looking at possibly a 6.4 stack um, with Mesa 23.1, 23.2. Maybe we'll have a triangle midsummer, but I got all the patches integrated right now, and we're basically relying on a couple of TI enablements on the display side. But yeah, in theory, we should have a fully open source triangle showing by midsummer. Yep. And, this and is working in coordination mm -hmm. with TI, Imagination, and big group of people. Yeah, so there's a compliance test with Vulkan, uh, which is what Imagination is working through right now. Uh, once we do get all those compliance uh, test cases passing, then we, we will start seeing the formal patches appear in kernel. Right now, it is an RFC V2, which was posted a few weeks back. But that's like your building block on which MISA comes along, Zinc providing your uh, GLX interface for any standard applications to start using graphics acceleration. Um, so it's, good. it's it's a fun fun roadmap ahead. And what's nice is inside Mesa right now, the imaginations, a lot of their patches have been merged. Their tree for their Vulkan driver is there. Zinc's all there. The big thing we're waiting on is the kernel DRM patch from iMation that everyone can agree with. This is a good way to go because it's there's a lot of historical drivers from iMation. So how do you clean that up? And like this has to be a fully open source version of the DRM. So that is, it's taken some time and it'll continue to take some time because you're talking about 20, you know, 10, 15 years of they did drivers one way. So, yep. And it doesn't just stop at graphics. Uh, you can use Vulkan compute with that architecture. 
and you can get a lot of AI capability out of the GPU too. So there's there's a lot more that you can start building up once these pieces come to the. Yeah, so we'll definitely get somebody from Imagination for a for a future episode here, and we'll do a GPU only Beagle cast. Oh man, yeah, yeah. Manuel would love that. Yeah. So I think, I mean, the Beagle world gives you a lot to kind of dive into. And of course, you don't necessarily need to do a GPU, but, um, you know, Beagle Play is only kind of one of our kind of, I mean, that, to me, that's the latest, that's the fun, it's affordable, it's, it's um, you know, great for these HMI and, and almost as when you start talking about AI applications, right, I think you have to bring back up AI64 and all the integration that goes on there because you think AM62 is complicated right <laughs> you know then you know tda4 right and and still lots there like you don't have to deal with all the complications just to get started using it right you know you just plug in you know it's a mini display port you plug that into your your monitor keyboard and mouse right and it's just a computer you just use it like a computer there's really you don't have to understand you know how what the, the six r fives are doing in there and the the all the I don't know how many M4s and, um, you know, I think there's 12 PRU cores in the, um, the TDA4 on the Beagle Bunny i64. Um, you know, there's, is there, is there one or two GPUs? A single GPU. It's just a single Multicore. GPU. But okay. bigger. Cause, yeah. Yeah. Cause I think the way the, the original Beagle Bunny AI did it was with, um, um, was with, with two GPU cores, but I think, so this is just one big GPU core. Two C six six DSPs though, right? Which are you know 128 bit VLIW or 128 or 256 bit because they're they're still 32 bit instructions, but you have 128 bit wide instruction word, right? So you can do eight 32 bit instructions at a time on a C six six, and so you've got two of those um, that are that are really fun to program in, the, in and of themselves. Just like I, I you know back you know, was, has it really been, I don't even think about how long it's been. It's probably been 20 years since I was really programming C66 cores or C6 cores. It would have been 6.2, um, uh, C62, not AM62. And, um, <laughs> and then the new C7 with MMA, right? Um, right. So there's a lot of stuff to really dive deeply into. And of course the C66 actually had um, um, upstream GCC support. Um, I don't know if it's like dropped off in terms of being maintained, but like you had like full upstream GCC support um, for C6. Um, and then C7 is kind of a tweak um, to that architecture with MMA. Um, and there's a fair bit of documentation out there. But for most people, they're not even diving into programming the, the C6s and the, the C7s, right? They're getting what they need out of it by just running Python libraries, right? Just running um these uh you know the tensorflow light and uh onyx and um right and they are able to get the the firmware loads that already exist for those cores in a way that's programmable enough right it's got enough configuration in the the layout of how it's doing um the different matrix multiplies that you don't actually have to write code on them per se right you just use TensorFlow Lite, and you know you you get the layers that you want pushed out onto those accelerator cores, um, accelerator cores, right? They're they're processors, right? They're just they're just you know accelerator cores, right? Some they're just processors that are really good at doing certain math really fast. Um, Although I will say I would have absolutely killed to have something like the AI sixty four back in my uh, in college DSP classes. Yeah, <laughs> that would have made life so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think like like programming on the the C sixes and stuff. I know Nishant, you're doing some stuff with R five uh, programming through like GDB and, and Open OCD, just using that's direct right. memory map, right? So I think that's super super empowering for people that want to program on some of these cores with fully open tool chains without having to go and um, you know use JTAG tools. Um, I don't know, man. I'm probably throwing it too many terms at once. <laughs> Right, but but like you know, um, I, I don't necessarily want to go searching for the lauder box to go and like do a little bit of programming on a core on a board, right? I just want to SSH into it and you know run the compiler and and you know, you know run a little bit of code and see some output, right? Um, you know, 
bring yeah, a little that's data in for memory. An entire theme for a whole episode, but I guess Nishant, do you want to do you want to talk a bit about <laughs> Open OCD and what you've been doing with it? Because I think it's exciting. Sure, sure. It's a lot of fun. It's Actually, there are few things I've been monkeying with. Um, just being a lazy guy, I hate picking up my JTAG debugger, plugging it in. Um, that is a physical activity I try to avoid. So it all started with that, uh, and I like programming this multiple little course sitting around doing some specific function of its own. Uh, what we looked in inside the SOC was that the same interface that you would go over JTAG, um, which uh, if I were to simplify it, it's it, it's basically twiggling uh, signals to get to specific cores via you know a hardware interface, just like how you would think USB for moving data. Um, but JTAG allows you to stop a processor, start a processor, literally step through how you would use a hello.c on your desktop, for example. Uh, OpenOCD abstracts all that away for you. Uh, OpenOCD is an open source program uh, maintained by a community. Uh, we contribute into that as well, and it has support for just about <clears throat> our platforms, um, most of the platforms, embedded platforms. Uh, it talks natively uh, JTAG interface for sure, and there are uh, standard tools or standard hardware blocks that you can use to talk to these uh, different types of processes that you what the experience that we wanted to create was why should this microcontroller programming be any different from how you would develop on your desktop a simple hello world and that's what we we try to achieve uh, we use open ocd to talk to the processor while running on the soc itself so from our perspective uh, from a developer perspective it is as simple as running gdb a dot out uh, it's equivalent to that. now the fact that you can use GDB protocol allows you to integrate with something like a standard ID, like say VS Code. So now the experience becomes as simple as debugging a Python program, but you are actually debugging a microcontroller sitting on inside the same processor. That allows us to do a lot more stuff. With that interface, um, I started learning Rust. Uh, and if you're doing cargo test, for example, it interfaces in the backend with GDB and your entire development flow is completely uniform with no physical external tools needed. So Beagle and you know both Play and AI64 is a complete environment of its own. That makes it exciting and much more nicer for you know lazy people like me. Yeah. I mean I really wonder how many how many Beagle users, right? What how many of them actually pick up a JTAG connector? Because you know the number one complaint I, I get and you know let's just be open and, and honest about that, right? Is this thing right here. This is the, the like. I think more people complain about the fact that they, if they want to use JTAG on the latest Beagles, is they have to go buy one of these, right? And um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I think it's really important for us not to make every single person pay for you know a JTAG header, um, or us to put the space on the board, right? When you can just go buy one of these, but um, you know, it's the it's the I you know I wish I knew more about like the the real profile of a Beagle user. I think it's it's honestly a great mystery because they span all sorts of levels of expertise, right? So um, I think we kind of caused that too when we had the original Beagle Bone. We had the onboard JTAG and we we accidentally shipped a couple hundred thousand of those units to customers. So I think they expected after <laughs> that board. So if we would have never done that, <laughs> I mean. We were coming from a JTAG world and like, you know, using JTAG all the time. But like the last time it's been years since I've connected JTAG and used it, right? Years. I don't use it, right? I barely use the UART, right? So, you know, once a, a bootloader is bootstrapped and I'm able to, to SSH in, right? Um, you know, I, I, I I go for weeks without even breaking out a UART cable. So, um, yeah, I kind of work in U-boot uh, quite a bit. <laughs> and, you know, the basic bootloader for me to say, say print debugging, use JTAG. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. If you're not working in U-boot, I think the goal is that it works well enough that you don't need to think about it, right? Oh, well, we just need exactly. a CDC class in U-boot so that way plug USB in. Yeah. When I when I debug a board, that's that's what I'm doing as well. Is you know I got the serial cable in, and then once Debian's actually up and running, and I have the USB uh, USB serial gadget, you know, forget serial it. Serial cable gets thrown out the window, and then I lose it for a couple of weeks until I need to use it the next time, and then I can't find it. 
So if I if I set these JTAG cables, like I said, I haven't used it for years. But if I if I set these things anywhere else besides right here on my desk, I'll never find them again because I don't go to look for them often enough. Yeah, I have them set <laughs> somewhere. Couldn't tell you where they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the actual like JTAG emulator, right? There's actually no like JTAG emulator beside it. It's just the cables. <laughs> <laughs> which I just use for testing the boards, right? To make sure that the, the connections are right. Then I, you know, as long as somebody else can JTAG, great. <laughs> somebody else, not me. Nishan's holding his comments there. Yeah. And, you know, so you know, we kind of have to make our, our best guess, right? When defining beagles, right? What people are really going to use and what people are going to use them for, because they're 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 always you know you know um, more flexible and used in more cases and more ways and more different ways than what we can um, imagine right and that's kind of the the the, the beauty of it. I'm, I was sitting here looking at some of the the different things that the people have just done recently right. So of course Andres um, stuff pops up real fast right, but um, <laughs> you know doing the the 3D printer controls and doing. Um, you know the Zigbee interfaces. Um, I know that the the Mender guys, um, are, are, um, you know, you know, he's been you know kind of hinting at doing something fun with 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 Beagle plays as well. Um, that would be somebody interesting to have um, on on one of these in the future as well, right? So folks over at, at um, Mender.io or any of our um, friends at the different. Um, you know, Linux consultant groups. Yeah, the Yosef had done um, over there update with Mender. That will be pretty interesting too, I think. That, with that, you can control a fleet of these boards and update them dynamically. And you have rollback capability. Speaking of some of these vendors, it makes you wonder if we should bring back the trolls from like 12 or 13 years ago. Like, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> Go back in time, grab some old Beagle developers. Now remember all, all that asking for 64-bit platforms? It's here now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, we, we should we should probably check in on, on Deepak. I know it's a little bit. There's a lot of latency over there. So, um, but maybe we should ask him about uh, the GSOC and um, the documentation. Yeah, and some of the great uh, YouTube videos he's done recently for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, documentation stuff started last year and it's not at the right place right now but we are slowly going towards creating very good documentation uh like a place where all the boards are uh well documented although we need a lot of help from like anybody who uh, ever used any beaglebone uh they can just uh like support in terms of what hardware they have used uh, they can uh, list down accessories and all so uh, we need help there and uh, regarding GSOC, I have been a GSOC student myself. I uh, did my uh, Google Summer of Code 2020 with BeagleBoard.org. And actually, maybe I am the only one who doesn't have a electronics degree. I am a biotechnologist by profession. So I worked with DNA, RDNA technology, how vaccines work and all that stuff. But I love electronics since my childhood. So that's what I have been doing since, like, as far as I can remember, I have been uh, doing electronics. Then I uh, learned about uh, software during college years. That's how it started. And during GSOC, I uh, had a very good experience learning a lot, uh, very good mentors. Actually, they helped me to build Upsidon Labs, which is uh, focusing on open source uh, DIY neuroscience kits. And uh, we are the first company in India to develop and distribute those kind of kits. So during GSOC, I worked on a project called Cape Compatibility Layer for uh, BeagleBone Black and BeagleBone AI. And uh, slowly, we are uh, like taking that uh, device tree from like it, it's kind of a way to define all the buses and how you use the GPIOs, you, how you can easily create device tree overlays. And then uh, since then, we are using uh, the same uh, core device tree nodes and all for other boards as well to make things easy for students and uh, all the other users to create new overlays and using all the GPIOs, all the buses. 
and after that uh, since 2021 i have been a mentor as well so every year we have great students on board and they work on great projects related to ai uh, embedded linux uh, microcontrollers starting this year and very exciting uh, robotics projects as well uh, during uh, gsoc as well as after uh, gsoc and there are also some projects that are lined up that are very cool related to ai and robotics hopefully this year we'll have more uh, good documentation and there are uh, there are four students this year and they will be working you know, on uh, accelerating ai models and uh, the first of grebus and all so we'll be talking about this talk more uh, in the coming uh, weekly cast episodes hopefully and yeah that was all for, from my side you know for sure yeah i think that's going to yeah. be a recurring theme um but that's actually a good segue to talk about beagle connect freedom because we've kind of hinted about it on home uh on the home assistant part of the the show but um you know there's zephyr there's you know developments of grebus you want to talk about that jason sure a little bit um so we've already got mainline support um in zephyr right so you can actually pull from um directly from the the, the zephyr repos find documentation on, on getting started with it in uh, uh, Zephyr itself. Um, I'm planning on doing a talk more about working with Zephyr tightly with Linux at EOSS in Prague um, towards the end of June, right? So there's a embedded open source summit, um, including the Zephyr summit and the embedded Linux uh, conference Europe, um, all co-located there in, uh, in, in Prague. So I'll be um, getting to travel to Prague um, uh get to see all the um the, the original beagle folks in the in the in the in, in, in europe hopefully we'll have a good turnout um, um from the embedded linux crew out there um but really talking about how like in, in zephyr you've got a um a really nice uh sensor driver framework right so for an embedded rtos right it looks like what you're comfortable with from a a, a linux standpoint in some ways and, and yes, that does mean um, device trees and, and def configs and config fragments, um, which might be a little in intimidating for some people, but it's also really functional to get really small images, right? You can build like a five kilobyte uh, Zephyr image, um, and so it can get it can get it can get pretty pretty small, um, uh, but it's it's a really configurable um, kernel. Um, you can just kind of, it has a POSIX layer, so you can just kind of build standalone applications um, with it. And um, like, so it, you can take things like MicroPython. Um, so we've got a MicroPython build for Beagle Connect Freedom, right? So it just kind of exists as its, as its own application. Um, but we've also embedded a little server in it, so you can run it, uh, uh, MCU Manager, which is a um, like a, it's a, a management layer where you can send packets to it. You can um, issue over the sub gigahertz network, um, like uh, firmware update requests and um, and kind of status on the, the device, um, you know, at the same time as you're sitting and running, you know, MicroPython, um, you know, uh, directly with the REPL and whatever script that you're running. Um, so it's, a, it's, um, you can make things that are really simple, but it's also got a very rich um, um, environment for doing things. And I, I, I like having device driver models where you could just use the sensor API and do things at a, um, at a high level. And I think that makes the code a lot more um, reusable and it gives you one place to kind of push um, all the, the bug fixes right to. So if anybody wants to change something about Zephyr on Beagle Connect Freedom, it's really easy to figure out how, right? You just push it into um, the main um, Zephyr repositories. Um, so and it's just helpful for some of the <coughs> Linux paradigm, right? Of, how to, of the way of doing things in that kind of model versus, you know, RTOS or, or, or no RTOS. Right. And then with our, our, our gray bus daemon, right, we can kind of, we can do things to remote the interfaces all the way to Linux. Um, so we're really trying to streamline ways for people that are Linux developers to get like, you know, down into the the, the microcontroller um, real time level, um, 
And one of the, the fun things that I saw show up in, um, I think Andre, you might have pointed this out to me, um, maybe a couple months ago. Um, is there, there's somebody did Zephyr for Beagle Play, right, on the A53s, um, which I think is, is is pretty cool. So I think I think Zephyr is a really important technology, you know, to get familiar with. Um, and Beagle Connect Freedom is a great way to play with that. They've got great networking stacks, and of course, it supports the the sub gigahertz network, so you can talk to the the Beagle Play from a kilometer away. I think there's a lot of possibilities in the future of stuff to enable. You know, you've you've mentioned Gray Bus. There's the possibility to do um, multi protocol, so you could add BLE into the into the mix from the Freedom itself. So you could think of things like you know, usually that's like provisioning if you want to do it locally and you don't want to enable it over a network. Um, there's a lot at, of use cases out there. It's just you, it's it's limited by your creativity, and, and that's about it. Yeah, you look at like folks like uh, Goliath, um, um, you know, that that are doing um, remote management of microcontroller-based uh, systems, right? I think it works really nicely in there with the Goliath framework. So you can you can you know we've got MCU boot. You could do um, um, remote provisioning and management of the microcontroller frameworks there with with, uh, with something like Goliath. And another one of the former um, uh, GSOC students with BeagleBoard actually did an Arduino core port to um, Zephyr, right? So if you wanted to um, uh, use you know Arduino uh, programming style uh, to program Beagle Connect Freedom, right? That's possible through the the Zephyr port, and so we'll be working on providing um, images for that. So I've been doing um, kind of the the built firmware releases for for MicroPython. Um, and for like the, the little sensor test is just kind of a, a, a simple little Zephyr app with the console, um, which you could even like telnet into, um, and, um, and, 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 you know, run with MC manager, but I'll be working on one also to do, um, the Arduino core, right? So if you wanted to program it using, um, Arduino code, you could do that as well. That's really exciting. And I very much welcome anybody that wants to, to you know, get involved in, in some of that stuff, right? So I think with the, like with the documentation as well, everything that Beagle's doing, um, you know, we kind of we 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 pushed the core of our development to get.beagleboard.org, right? So our own GitLab instance. Um, in some cases, we're trying to keep some mirrors up on GitHub, and I don't know that we're really great at doing those GitHub mirrors. So if you're really wondering what's going on, don't just look at the stuff on GitHub. Get on get.beagleboard.org. Um, like all the documentation, um, you know, the docs.beagleboard.org um, is now maintained through git.beagleboard.org, right? And so if you go to docs.beagleboard.org, um, you'll see an edit on GitLab. Um, that'll directly take you to like the, the, the main development fork, and then you can fork and create your own version of the documentations and just pull requests. Um, you can also file issues and get us to prioritize um, some of the, the questions that, that people have, right? I think that, you know, um, we still have a, a, a long way to go, but I think if we can get some, some priorities down for, 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 for all of us, right, we can, you know, enable the community as fast as possible. And then what Jason didn't mention about our GitLab, we also have our own CI behind the scenes. So we build on ARM64, AMD64, other QEM architectures and basically, yeah, it allows us to control our infrastructure, test all our own stuff and, you know, enable as much CI as we need. Yeah. You mentioned QEMU, but we, we also have a, we've been, been playing with risk five a fair bit, right. With at Beagle. So, um, we've also got some, some, some risk five GitLab runners. <gasps> <laughs> I didn't want to say it, Jason said it. <laughs> Ah, yeah, I know. I'm <laughs> a little more willing to get myself in trouble. The teasers, oh, the teasers. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So for sure, people should contribute as much as, you know, if, if, if you think there's something that's stopping you from building your next project, feel free to ask away, tweet at Jason, you know, put up a GitHub issue and or a GitLab issue, I should say, rather. Um, yeah. And chances are you get it answered or at least someone will look at it and be like, wow, that's an issue. So, you know. And at least for me, I keep a public calendar, right? So I keep a public calendar so people can go to calendly.com slash jkreidner and, you know, get 30 minutes with me, right? So, right, unless, you know, yeah. I, I, I Hopefully they posted something to the forum first. Um, otherwise, I'll just tell them, hey, post something to the forum. Because um, you usually get better answers on the forum than you do from me. Um, 
but but if I need if something needs to be escalated, you need me to go handle something or need something to be prioritized, um, it's okay to put something on my calendar. And if you're interested in working on something, don't let like lack of hardware stop you. Just ping us. We can set up uh, SSH accounts for you to log in. Hey, here's a builder you can play with for a few months. You know, we're not. If you want to work on something, yeah, just ask. We'll help you. Yeah, hundred percent. The goal is to be friendly and enable people. So definitely, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. None, none of us have been known to bite, as far as I know. Maybe Nishan. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let's check with TIHR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are also on Slack, uh, on IRC. Uh, Jason, I don't think we have got on to Discord. Yet, right? uh, no, we haven't. Just our forum is on Discourse. Um, so one of the, one of the, I, I've been chatting with actually the GitLab folks a little bit because I wanted to try to make our GitLab a little bit more scalable. Like when I wanted to deploy all these different, um, so we use AWS for our our hosting, um, and for the most part, we just have a single EC2 instance that we spun different uh, things off of. Um, but like um, like some of these GitLab runner jobs can be pretty big and. Um, so I'm trying to look at like either scaling out through Amazon ECS, um, you know, trying to get some maybe, uh, you know, um, colo for, you know, a, a big pile of our boards, um, um, you know, but, but like Discord is a little bit on the, like, you know, it's kind of two or three steps deep for me right now because I want to try to uh, get a, um, a way I can deploy our Discord server um, in a, like a, a manageable way, right? We don't have much of a IT department, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, you know, if, if, you know, anybody in DevOps wants to to show up and and do some some volunteer work for a nonprofit, um, or even you know, small contracting, small, small, <laughs> small. <laughs> um, anyways, that's one of the reasons I've been reaching out to the GitLab folks, right? Because it'd be nice to support open software um, from the foundation, right? We use, we really love GitLab. And so, you know, if we can find a way to have them help us, that'd be, that'd be ideal. That's definitely something to look forward to as well. And in the meantime, there is IRC and, and all these other channels, like, like Nishan mentioned. Yay, IRC, yay freedom. So that's that's the bulk of topics for today. I think anything related to capes, add-ons, do you wanna, do you wanna tease uh, vehicles perhaps? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. The shant has has uh, gracefully volunteered to actually spend a little bit of time on it. But um, you know, this is um, one of the things I keep not spending time on. Um, but it's actually a fairly easy thing. So this is the Beagle Car remote, right? So we've teased Beagle Car in the past um, and working on the, the 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 robotics cape that goes with it. And I think we're actually supposed to get um, motor drivers um, in next month <laughs> um so we can actually make more of them um so um but in the meantime it's kind of put some extra pressure since we've got some motor drivers coming to go ahead and get this guy working i think this one's really fun now that that uh, beagle connect freedom is actually out there and available um you know we 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 built this remote um so that you can control um the ai64 with it right and the um do I have? The, oh, uh, oh! It's of course it's powered on. So let's see if I can do this nicely. But um, this is the robotics cape, um, and it's got a spot for a, the Beagle Connect to it, right? So you could actually use that that BCF serial driver, the same one that we're using on um, um, the Beagle Play, uh, to talk to the. Um, and uh, that's, to that's to sitting the, on top of AI sixty four there. Yeah, right. So that integrates Beagle Connect um, into the AI64, right? So with that robotics cape, you don't just get the, um, the all the motor drive capabilities and the IMU and um, the CAN bus buys and all that other cool stuff for making robotics. You also get that uh, the connection there for the Beagle Connect. You can get the long range wireless network <coughs> and our fun, cool like remote control with the a nice little LED display so we can kind of display some tele telemetry data. Um, That's funny. It looks like you have a slot for an 8650 battery on the back there. So it's just yeah, whenever you want it. Just swappable yeah. single cell LiPo. The charger is actually embedded into the Beagle Connect Freedom. Um, so you just plug this into your Type-C and it charges your, 
your your swappable lipo battery um and you know that's fairly simple construction right with just the um the laser cut plastic um right um so you know i think it's a fairly modifiable design if anybody wants to kind of uh you know take it and extend it um yep so that's one of the the, the cool things that we're, we're we're working on um in terms of accessories um yeah um too many projects not enough, Const- not enough hours in the day yeah yeah so too much fun <laughs> all the fun in the world but hey it's a it's a great deal of fun if you're like the kind of person like you know a lot of us i think are the type of people that are easily distracted or easily bored by things so it's i i don't think we ever get to be bored of beagle you know there's there's enough things to jump on at, at any one time that it's uh you know it keeps us entertained if you're bored talk to me <laughs> Are you wrapping us out? I think so. Yeah. So I think great, great first, great first go in here. Um, You know, this is just episode zero. See you guys, I guess, in in two weeks with uh, with new guests, new topics, and more shenanigans. All right. So thanks, thanks everyone for joining, and see you in the next one.